chemical energy is to long-term space colonization what squeezing a cow's nipples is to making cheese. A technically necessary component of the process, but one we'd all like to forget about and preferably find another way of doing. Chemical energy can be pretty impactful, a lesson I learned the hard way that time I ate two cans of beans and blew a hole in the drywall, but when you're trying to travel distances measured in light years, chemical energy kinda sucks. Well, there is an obvious alternative. Nuclear. And nuclear energy comes in two flavours, ripping things apart and slapping things together. When you break out the sticky notes and run some numbers, you find that fusion is not only the less likely of the two to explode if someone stands nearby and coughs too aggressively, but also generates so much energy it could power my will to live. But there's an extra subdivision of nuclear fusion, natural and artificial. Artificial fusion is the thing that seems to have the exact same breakthrough every couple of years that ultimately doesn't amount to anything but everyone always seems to forget the last 14 times it's happened in a sequence of events that has me semi-convinced I'm trapped in a time vortex. Natural fusion is the thing that powers the giant ball of fire in the sky, the big one that turns off at night. Thing is, in the long term, and I do mean the long term, I reckon natural fusion is actually a better energy source for human civilization. First off, you don't need to do anything to make it happen. The universe is an ocean of naturally occurring energy sources with lifespans in the billions or in some cases trillions of years. You can just walk up to it with a solar panel and collect free energy. Second, interstellar civilization is probably going to exist forever once it happens. I know that sounds like a statement that will age poorly, like babies named Daenerys, but literally nothing known to science can destroy a species with interstellar technology. Worst case scenario, a star goes supernova and everyone packs their bags and takes a vacation to space Tenerife, and if a civilization is going to exist in some form or another for a cosmic length of time, that 0.01% of the solar system's mass that exists in the planets is going to run dry fairly quickly in comparison to the godlike ball of free energy hanging out in the middle. Why fanny about hauling hydrogen off the gas giants and trying to fuse it manually when every star in the universe is doing it for you for free? Harnessing stellar energy is considered by a lot of scientists to be such an obvious step in the evolution of spacefaring civilizations that the fact we don't see anyone doing it nearby isn't considered evidence that the idea is flawed, but rather evidence that we're probably the only intelligent species in our space postcode. So let's say we want to harness natural nuclear fusion. And wouldn't you know it, the way to do this is with space orbs, the type of which you were promised in the title of this video. Okay, I should probably be more specific since space orbs could refer to almost everything that exists in physical reality now that I think about it. I'm talking specifically about Dyson spheres. A Dyson sphere is a hypothetical structure surrounding a star that collects all its energy. You may be familiar with the concept if you've ever heard someone talk about the Kardashev scale. Quick tangent, the Kardashev scale is a rough measurement of how much power a civilization can harness. It officially goes from K1 to K3. A K1 is a civilization that harnesses all the energy of its home planet. A K2 harnesses all the energy of its solar system, and a K3 harnesses the power of friendship, just kidding, an entire galaxy. Each level uses about 10 billion times more energy than the previous one, making the scale logarithmic. Just for reference, all of collective humanity is between a 0.7 and a 0.8 right now, which might make you feel a little pathetic, but don't worry, the way you behave is the thing that makes you pathetic. Since the scale works like this, the jump from where we're at to K1 is actually still pretty huge, like another few hundred years huge. Likewise, you could have your own K0.1 civilization with a few big fields and a positive attitude, so humanity shouldn't go feeling too proud of itself in either direction, to be honest. There are also proposed stages beyond K3, but the exact limits of what's possible are a little hazy, so anything beyond K3 is the equivalent of coming up with a fan-created Dragon Ball Z character with somehow even more ridiculous hair than normal and claiming they can bench press twice as many planets as someone in the show. Oh, I can imagine a civilization that accesses every form of energy in every conceivable universe. Nice work, idiot. Now try imagining a version of yourself with a job. Anyway, a Dyson Sphere is basically a shell of solar panels orbiting a sun. You collect all the energy and use it to power your civilization. Saying it like that doesn't really do it justice, because the scale involved is, and I'm using my vocabulary precisely here, f***ing nuts. This thing wouldn't be the size of a planet or a sun, it would be the size of an orbit of a planet around a sun. But even though it's huge, the panels that would make it up would be thin and lightweight, meaning you could actually get the materials for this just by doing an extensive mining operation on Mercury, for example. If you automated a process of sending machines to Mercury which can mine it, create panels, and create more mining machines that would in turn make more panels and more mining machines, you could conceivably construct a Dyson Sphere in a non-ridiculous amount of time. This general architecture was the original meaning of Dyson Sphere 
sphere, but appearances in various pieces of media over the years seem to like depicting it as a solid sphere with people living on the inner side. This is just plain stupid for a few reasons. First, this system is gravitationally unstable for reasons I can't be bothered to explain, so either you need to install gigantic thrusters on it to keep it centred on the star, or it's going to start sliding sideways and eventually kill the countless trillions of people presumably living in it. Second, if you want people living in this thing to have an Earth-like climate, they'd need to be at a similar distance from the star in the centre as Earth is from the Sun. You'd also need to spin it to create artificial gravity, and the material strength of anything in the known universe wouldn't be able to take the stresses involved of both of those things at the same time, also killing everyone. And third, even if you get around the previous two problems, the walls of this thing would have to be at least relatively thick, meaning there wouldn't be enough material to build this thing, even if you destroyed every planet in the solar system to build it. Anyway, to differentiate between the idea that works and the one that makes no sense, we now call what was originally known as a Dyson Sphere, a Dyson Swarm. To be honest, I'm not a fan of how the original name for the correct idea has to be the one to change to something less cool sounding. That'd be like if brain cell deficient cretins kept using the word car to describe a unicycle, and we all collectively said, sure, that can be a car, and what we used to call a car, we will now call a turd wagon. Anyway, the scale of something like a Dyson Sphere, as I refuse to stop calling it, is just incomprehensible to a human. Not just the size, think about the energy this thing would collect. All the life on Earth exists because things eat other things, and the things that get eaten by everything else eat plants, and the plants eat sunlight. So you, and almost everything alive on this planet, is ultimately powered by the sun. We burn coal and oil for energy, which are all dead plants, which is again just solar with extra steps. Wind turbines are pushed by the wind because the wind is heated up by the sun. Pretty much everything is ultimately solar, other than nuclear power, which is us just doing what the sun is doing, but worse. All of the solar powered things on Earth are possible because of the tiny amount of light that hit the Earth and that aren't reflected. And how much of the Sun's energy even reaches the Earth in the first place? Like, what, a few millionths of the energy it puts out? Just imagine having all of it. All of it. Even if we had trillions of mouths to feed, imagine the abundance, imagine the quality of life we could give everyone, imagine the places we could go, the things we could do, imagine how much lasagna you could reheat.